conversation, exploring what makes libraries smart, the role of AI and libraries in the future, and what role libraries can play in smart city development. I'm grateful to our symposium committee, Dr. Su Young Sun, Sung Un Kim, and Young Choi for all their work putting together this fascinating symposium. And I'm grateful to the panelists and participates for your participants for your insight and conversations. I wish you every success in your conversation this morning. Welcome to Catholic University. I know you'll enjoy the conversation and profit by it. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Smith. Um, now I would like to introduce Dr. Young Choi, the, the chair of the Department of Library Information Science. She will briefly share the history and background of the symposium. Good morning. I am Young Choi and the chair of the Department of Library Information Science. It is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining our event. Our symposium, Bridging the Spectrum, is 15 years old. We held the first symposium at Maristow Hall, one of the historic buildings on campus, in January 2009. Since then, this symposium has become a unique scholarly event to share and discuss ideas, innovative practice, and research activities. So every year, more than 120 researchers students and practitioners gather from all sectors of our community in the DC area and beyond. On average, 13 presentations and 17 posters uh, uh, are delivered each year. Topics and ideas discussed at the symposia are varied and reflective of trends and current practice in the field. Keynote speakers were invited from the ALA, public libraries, academic libraries, government agencies, public schools, and the Smithsonian Institution, the Pew Research Center, and to name a few. So organizing and hosting this unique event reflects the commitment of the CUA, Department of Library Information Science, in engaging a dialogue of ongoing development of the profession. So I take great pride in our department in fulfilling its mission and leadership in knowledge sharing for the profession. So I am confident that many more anniversary and more achievements are yet to come our way. So in closing, I'd like to thank the panelists and attendees for joining and bringing your expertise to the symposium. I would also like to thank the symposium committee, especially Dr. Sin and Dr. Kim for their hard work in organizing this 15th annual symposium. I hope you enjoy today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Choi. I hope you will continue to find the symposium a useful venue to share and discuss professional issues in the future. Um, now let's get started with our panel discussion. This year, the symposium committee selected the theme, smart libraries, what does it mean to be smarter? With a lot of technologies emerging these days, libraries and librarians are also discussing implementation of smart libraries and their impact. Our panelists today will share their knowledge and experience of smart libraries. The first two panelists will be uh, will be uh, the, the first two presentations will be delivered by Zef Bisnevsky from the University of Pittsburgh Library System and Trevor Watkins from um, George, George Mason University Libraries. They will discuss how libraries can set the stage to implement smart libraries, including space and technology. The second two presentations will be delivered by Lars Binal at the Techn Technical University of Denmark Media Lab in Denmark and Tulga Vyanamek at SUNY Arbani. Um, they will discuss about their project on smart library implementation and its wider community impact. We'll have two Q&A sessions each after two presentations. Please use the Q&A button for your presentation, or your questions. Um, let's start with our, um, with our first panelist, Jeff Binevsky. Um, Jeff is the Director of um, Web Services and Communications at the University of Pittsburgh Library System. 
He provides strategic oversight of the library's over 100 websites, ex external marketing and communications, social media, and grant writing and support activities. He serves on the library leadership team, provides strategic guidance to the library's planning and budgeting committee, and has been a part of the team responsible for shaping the spaces and programs for the Pittsburgh campus main libraries, top to bottom five year renovation. Um, please welcome Jeff. Uh, good morning, thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Okay, so I hope we can all see that. Good. Yes, okay, I'm getting a nod, That that's great. Um, so on today's panel, I think we're going to hear um, about some really interesting and exciting technologies, things like VR, AR, XR, um, artificial intelligence, and a whole bunch of other technologies that um, have the potential to have a really, um, really strong impact in, in our libraries and in our communities. Um, and I think there is a temptation to sort of, you know, want to dive in to the technology uh, before sort of, you know, making sure that the stage is set, that the particular technology, whatever it might be, um, <clears throat> is is um, is sort of appropriate for um, your organization and your community, uh, is um, sustainable for uh, for the library and and for the community, uh, and will be impactful. Um, so. Before uh, my colleagues um, talk about the really cool stuff, I'm going to talk about the the more boring stuff, which is um, how to sort of set the stage for the successful implementation uh, of some of these uh, some of these technologies. Um, so this is just a little bit about me. Um, I think we covered all this in the introduction. So. Um, First of all, it's just sort of a definitional question. So when we think about smart library or smart city, um, you know, I think we think about um, a particular um, suite of technologies implemented in a space. That space could be a library, it could be, uh, it could be a city, it could be, uh, it could be something else. Um, and those technologies are generally things like, um, you know, sort of different types of sensors, so audio sensors, video, uh, visual sensors. Um, activity sensors, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, technology like beacons that can send and receive information to people's smart devices, for example. Uh, things like um, artificial intelligence uh, and things like VR, AR, XR, and all those sorts of things. So um, that is sort of one definition of what a smart library or a smart city, um, for example, um, can be. But there is, I think, a more expansive definition that I think it's important to keep in mind, and that's what I would like to um, that's what I would like to talk about. So, you know, the main idea is that um, before we dive in to exploring any of these technologies, we have to make sure that we've sort of set the table in an appropriate way to make sure that those technologies are um, are sustainable and are useful and will be impactful uh, for um, for our communities. Um, and in order to do that, I think there are a suite of sort of um, smart practices that it's important for um, libraries to sort of, you know, think about and, and uh, implement and emulate uh, before you even get to the point of talking about um, implementing any particular technology. And so what are these practices? Um, flexibility, and I'll talk more about these as we as we move along. Um, so, you know, we have we have flexibility and we, that's, you know, flexibility with uh, with the technology itself, flexibility with staff, flexibility with spaces. Uh, we talk about data informed decision making and you know I think I, it's important to point out here that we're talking about data informed as opposed to data driven so um, the, the the data that we collect via um, either these smart technologies or through any other means um, are uh, one important input um, into the decision making process 
um, but shouldn't be necessarily prescriptive. So um, the data can help us make decisions, but shouldn't make the decisions for us. Um, there is this idea of, of continuous uh, assessment. So um, I think it's important that libraries move away from the annual or biannual uh, um, survey of, of their communities, you know, which is not to say um, that that's, you know, not a, a not a, not an unreasonable practice, um, but I think we should move closer to the idea that we are assessing continuously and and using um, a whole bunch of different means and methodologies and assessing um, sort of at the point of service where we can. And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I, I I think the idea of sort of the community as a partner. Um, as opposed to uh, a relationship where the library serves a particular community is kind of a helpful reframing of that relationship because I think um, I think that you know the 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 community informs the library and the library informs the community. And if we're both listening to each other and in in sort of a partnership, um, then we're setting the stage for really sort of successful um, successful futures. Um, I think we would be remiss if we didn't um, sort of think about what it was that we learned during um, during those 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 dark years um, that are are uh, in the rearview mirror now. Fortunately, so libraries learned. Libraries had to to pivot very quickly. Libraries had to um, make a switch to um, uh, to to a, a more digitally rich way of interacting with their their patrons. And so I think it's, you know, there's a lot that we, I think, have learned about that. And it's important, I think, to keep that in mind as we're moving forward. Uh, there is this idea of smart staffing, right? So so right now um, in the world generally, um, uh, and libraries aren't immune from this, uh, you know, there is uh, there is sort of a challenge around retention of, of staff. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. There is the idea of, of um, Hiring for skills as opposed to um, as opposed to degrees in a competitive uh, labor market, which we find ourselves in right now. Um, I, there is this idea. I think that you should embed in your culture um, uh, a, a process, and and what that process is, you know, is, is sort of can vary library to library and community to community. Uh, but the idea that um, as part of our um, strategic uh, as part of our st strategic planning that we should build into that process um, some way um, to sort of look towards the near future. So looking five years or 10 years out and making informed predictions about what um, what might be coming down the road and embedding that practice um, into your into your libraries culture so that we can be prepared for, for um, various potential futures. Um, and then finally, um, obviously most libraries are doing some form of strategic planning, um, <clears throat> but then um, I like the idea also of, 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 of tying strategic planning with the idea of strategic doing. Um, so um, making sure that our strategic plans um, are really living documents and are things that we, um, uh, that we really um, we sort of internalize and uh, use to guide um, guide our decision making because hopefully that strategic plan uh, is the result of a process whereby um, you've made sure that your um, your libraries uh, that your library is aligned very well with the needs of your community and if that is the case um, then your strategic plan can really provide a very very helpful roadmap um, as you as you sort of move forward and think about some of these technologies that we'll be talking about this morning. Um, so the idea of flexibility is certainly not a new um, cer certainly not a new idea, but but um, you know there is this idea of of sort of flexible data informed um, thinking. Um, so if if we do sort of have a culture whereby we are continually assessing, then we need to be open to. Um, what that data is suggesting um, to us and to be open to what that data is suggesting to us um, suggests a level of flexibility that I that I think we we need to um, that we need to sort of internalize. Um, flexible staff and staffing models. Um, so uh, you know, of course, as we we sort of implement these technologies, because libraries are um, generally operating in sort of a zero-sum environment where 
um, budgets aren't growing. Um, budgets are, if we're lucky, static, um, you know, which means that um, if we want to invest in some of these smart technologies, then we have to find resources for it. And where, we're, where we have to find those resources um, is primarily going to come from, from two places. It's going to come either from the library itself, so a reallocation of resources, and, and that is both dollars and staff, um, as well as um, uh, external funding, so uh, philanthropic and grant support funding. Um, and then, of course, flexible flexible technology and flexible spaces. So, you know, I, I um, as we are renovating our main library, one of the things I like to um, always um, like to always say is that, you know, today's utilities, today's um, utility closet uh, is tomorrow's um, AI development studio, which is to say, um, that we should design all of our spaces with um, with flexible and future uses in mind, because um, uh, the a space that is uh, serving one purpose today um, should be able to quickly pivot to serving a different need um, uh, as the as the as the needs change. Um, so you know, I talked about a little bit about the idea of 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 one of the aspects of being smart and uh, is continuous assessment. And so again, that's not to say that, you know, the annual or the biannual survey of of, of uh, faculty, staff, students, or or, or our uh, community isn't an, isn't an important input. Um, it is. Uh, but there are other ways um, to implement sort of more continuous uh, methods of, of assessment. Uh, you know, the idea Again, being that um, if we have this steady stream of information to help us make decisions and we are flexible enough uh, to be able to listen to those decisions that we are ultimately gonna be able to be um, more, uh, more helpful and impactful partners for our, for our communities. So there are lots of different, there are lots of ways in addition to surveying our, our communities to, to, um, um, to assess um, their, their activities and their needs. Um, Things like diary studies, um, which we've done. Um, there are a number of photography-based methods of assessment. Uh, there are point of contact uh, means of assessment. Um, there's this idea of sort of drive drive-by assessment. So uh, instead of you know take our 25 question survey, there is the you know the idea um, that on the website or somewhere else you would embed a one or two question survey um, to get information about some sort of particular particular topic. Um, the idea that we are partners um, with our communities, I think, is really uh, is really important. Um, and so that is to say, just to make sure that there is a strategic alignment between ourselves and our communities. Um, and that means that we need to we need to understand our communities, which is where the assessment comes in. We need to be talking to our communities. Uh, uh, and um, and we need to be sort of aware of what the future might hold, which is what it, which is that idea of building into our our strategic planning processes um, some type of futures thinking at some you know intervals every three years, every five years, every seven years, or something something like that. Um, I think it would be the opposite of smart if we if we we didn't do an assessment of of what it was we learned. Um, from the changes that we had to make during um, during the, the 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 COVID pandemic, um, and the the changes that we had to made the changes that we had to make uh, impacted libraries. Um, I think in in these and and many other ways. So um, I, I hope that we are sort of taking those lessons to heart and moving them forward because I know for us specifically, um, we learned some very important things about our 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 community that we have now sort of work to try and bake into, um, into the way that the library does business. So this idea of smart staffing um, that we're, you know, we're hiring for skills and not necessarily degrees. Um, uh, we are in a competitive labor market um, and there are positions in libraries for which we have traditionally required, for example, a bachelor's degree. Um, and it could be the case that we should be thinking about whether or not the, that, that degree is actually uh, actually necessary or helpful for that particular position. Um, at the same time, um, I think there are certainly um, there's certainly need for folks who have a library and information science background, but it's also the case that we um, have need for people and skills um, from different areas. 
And so rethinking um, some, some of those um, sort of degree requirements, I think is important. Um, the idea of sort of robust skilling and upskilling. Um, so, you know, taking the existing staff that we have um, and upskilling them so that they can be active in some of these, these, these smart spaces, smart technologies that we're, we're talking about. Um, when we talk about AI, one of the things that I um, always sort of think about is this idea that we are probably going to be able to offload um, some sort of, you know, routine um, tasks to to machines and whether, you know, whether or not that's um, in the area of writing reference, whether or not that's in the area of, of cataloging, whether or not it's, it's in another area. Um, I think it's going to be the case sooner rather than later that some of these routine tasks are going to be able to be done by machines. And so we need to be thinking about that. Um, in relationship to the way that we staff um, that we staff our libraries and deploy those those resources, and again, retention um, needs to be a strategic priority now in a, in a competitive labor market. Um, it's the case with us, and I'm guessing it's the case with with many other libraries that um, uh, we are having difficulty hiring people, and once we hire people, we're having difficulty retaining them. So um, it wasn't the case in the past, but I think it's the case that we need to elevate retention as a strategic priority. Um, this idea of building into um, your sort of, you know, your, your library cycle, um, some way of, of doing some sort of futures thinking or futures planning. Um, so in my library, as an example, we have a planning and budget committee that operates every year. And so they help us write a plan for that particular year. As part of their work, um, every five years, we have that group um, assist in leading the library in a sort of a futures thinking, um, a futures thinking project that is um, that is inclusive, uh, that includes all library staff and uh, library management. Um, and helps us to sort of, uh, you know, uh, make educated guesses about what's coming down the road. The particular methodology that we use is called scenario planning. Um, there are all there are a number of different scenarios, but the idea, uh, very briefly, is that you sort of take a look at what sort of what signals are out there, what technology signals are out there, what government signals are, are out there, what environmental signals are out there and so on and so forth. And then you make educated guesses about what those um, signals might mean for your parent institution and then uh, for you as a library. Um, you develop scenarios around those. And then around those scenarios, you, um, you make plans for uh, staffing, for technology, for services um, to prepare you for various potential possible features. Um, so I think it's important for for libraries to routinize that sort of that type of uh, futures thinking. And then finally, um, you know, if all of if you're doing all of these things, I think that you sort of get into a place where you're you're in a virtuous cycle, and um, you're listening uh, and you're doing and you're assessing and you're listening. Um, and uh, whether it be, you know, smart technologies or other technologies, I think uh, in those scenarios, you're, you're pos positioning yourself for success. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we will continue to our second panelist, um, Trevor Watkins. Trevor is the teaching, teaching and outreach librarian at George Mason University Libraries. He provides information literacy and broader digital era competencies such as numeric, visual data, and spatial and, con uh, and, and conduct library con carpentry workshops for the Digital Scholarship Center at GMUL. He is the te technical lead and chair of the web, com web committee of Project Stand. He is a member of the technical advisory group for the National Finding Aid Network, a collaboration between OCLC, the California Digital Library, Shift Collective, the University of Virginia, and the Chambridge Group. His research interests include AI literacy, human AI collaboration, STEM librarianship, information literacy, integration models, and open knowledge diffusion tools. 
Mr. Watkins has co-authored pu published papers and presentation at conferences and is an IMLS fellow for the IDEA Institute on Artificial Intelligence. In 2022, he was awarded the Kent State University iSchool Alumnus of the Year and his current projects include the Black Squirrel GNU Linux operating system, uh, cosmology of artificial intelligence, and um, Mason Libraries orientation conversational agent. Um, please welcome Trevor for his presentation. Thanks, um, Dr. Suyon. Can everybody see? Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you for that wonderful introduction, um, and uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, to be on this panel um, with, uh, with my uh, colleagues. Um, I just wanted to give or provide um, some contact information. So this is my email address, twalkin8 at gmu.edu, and this is my phone number to my office uh, in case you want to get a list of scholarship that I use to prepare for this presentation. Also, uh, if you want to know some of the things that I am currently reading um, and some of the projects for the projects that I'm working on uh, at GMU. Um, so let's talk about some of the objectives of this presentation. Trevor, um, I think your view is not the presentation view. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there we go. All right. Okay, so the objectives for today's discussion is to um, discuss some of the technology commonly used in smart libraries. I know that uh, Jeff already talked about some of those. Um, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence's role in the futures of, of smart libraries. Uh, what will the next generation library look like? Um, this will be coming from my perspective uh, and in current projects that I'm working on relative uh, to this talk. Learning outcomes. So um, after today, you should be able to describe technology commonly used in smart libraries, understand AI's role in the future of smart libraries, and also understand how AI can transform libraries into intelligent, dynamic, efficient, and accessible uh, institutions. All right, so you're going to obviously see some commonalities in our presentations um, regarding technologies in uh, smart libraries. So I wanted to discuss um, more in depthly on a few of those. Um, so when we talk about smart technology, you have Internet of Things um, and with IoT, uh, there are obviously several definitions for IoT, um, but when strategically designed for the purpose of creating a smart environment and in particular a smart library, I would define it as an ecosystem of heterogeneous interrelated things that could be sensors or uh, beacons, sensors uh, or technology with built-in sensors. Um, something that Jeff talked about. Um, some examples of that would be the Raspberry Pi, Arduino, um, antennas, RFID tags, et cetera. Um, they all have the ability to transfer data, whether that's library um, usage or patron behavior over a network, whether that's Bluetooth um, or the internet for further analysis. IoT can be used to create smart spaces by monitoring and analyzing how libraries are used. One really good example of this would be computer space or technology enhanced workspaces. So what I mean by that is every academic library, public library has computer labs and they also have technology enhanced workspaces. Um, so um, in, in some of those institutions, they have large desks and they have large monitors that strategically placed around the library where patrons or students can come in, they can plug their, their laptop into that, whether it's a double monitor setup or if it's a single large monitor so they can have more real estate to do work, um, whether that's programming or art, um, whatever that may be. Um, but imagine being able to 
look, you know, open your cell phone and in real time, see whether or not any of those spaces are actually available. So if I'm a student and I'm on campus um, on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, um, it'll be important for me if, if we had that technology to, to be able to look up the library and to see what workspaces are actually available. Um, a student can kind of structure their schedule based on that. Um, same thing with any faculty, um, and same thing with public libraries, um, patrons are coming in. Um, that's one of many ways that IoT can be used. Um, also, smart lighting. Um, you can adjust the lighting in the library, and, and most, uh, most public and academic libraries have this already, um, where that's based on the time of day, the amount of natural light um, that comes into the library and patrons occupying that particular space. Um, that saves the library money um, and energy costs. And um, I know for a lot of you, um, you know, the, the current energy um, utility bills have certainly skyrocketed. Um, so I've actually used some of this technology in my own home um, to, to, you know, to save, to save energy. Um, you also have smart parking. Um, that alerts patrons of the availability of parking spaces, which could reduce traffic congestion. So if I'm getting ready to go down to the library on Monday, I can simply look in my app and, okay, well, the garage is full. Maybe I'll take public transportation uh, on that day. Um, or if there isn't, if there, there's enough parking spaces, maybe I take my own vehicle there. Um, VR, uh, virtual reality, Many libraries have, and they're beginning to actually create virtual tours. So you probably see this already uh, if you're looking to buy a home or if you're um, you know, uh, looking to buy an apartment, you see some of those virtual tours. So libraries and, 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 and universities and some public libraries are starting to uh, integrate this into um, in, on, on their website. Um, and Patrons can actually don a VR headset, um, which allows them, or you know, it allows them to sort of interface with the library in a more creative way um, and a more engaging experience. Um, augmented reality, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more uh, when I talk about um, AI's role, um, has not really worked well thus far. Um, there's an article written by Carly Spina about how augmented reality was being utilized, and this is probably like um, seven, eight years ago. And there were uh, two specifically that she touched on, which was Shelv AR and Arisma. Shelv AR was used by, it was actually developed by the Miami University Library. Um, they had to discontinue it because Amazon had a patent um, that they would have infringed upon. Uh, and then you had Orisma, um, which um, the University of Houston downtown, we're actually using it for that purpose. HP acquired that. And then like most, um, um, most corporations or IT tech companies, um, they'll acquire that tech and then they'll sit on it and, and they'll discontinue it if, it if they can't find a use for it or if it is, um, um, if it's sort of an opposition to what they're trying to do. Um, but those applications are usually have been discontinued uh, or they're left in software limbo. Um, and what I mean by that is um, there is no per developer um, that's actually um, contributing to, um, to that software. And so maybe it may be sitting on GitHub somewhere um, or in, and I think one, I think Shell AR, you can actually contact them if you want to actually get the, get the software if you want to try to continue it, but the problem would be trying to navigate around uh, Amazon's um, uh, patent for that. Um, you also have digital signage, uh, which is used to market library events, resources, and services, which are strategically placed um, around the library as well. And then, of course, um, AI, how it's generally being used uh, in libraries to improve search, um, personalized recommendations, and automation. So. Um, integrated library systems. So if there's anyone uh, that's in the audience right now that are systems librarians, they know what I'm talking about. Or if you are, are going to become a systems librarian in the future, um, this is one way that you can use AI, AI to actually automate tasks uh, within the ILS. All 
All right, so let us briefly discuss how AI, uh, and I think how it will actually play a more integral role in the future of libraries. So most public and academic libraries have, are consistently trying to figure out um, what they will look like in five years, right? And in the next five years, same thing. And in the next five years, what is, what is it gonna look like? And a lot of that is predicated off the advancement of technology. Um, and a lot of that is also based on, um, as Jeffrey uh, touched on, um, you know, does your, does your, um, does your staff um, have the skill set um, or is, you know, are they provided professional development uh, opportunities to upskill? Um, so it's going to be predicated on that as well. Uh, at, at George Mason University Libraries, we're at the genesis of that conversation now um, in terms of, you know, what is, what is, what are we going to look like uh, in the future? Um, so I have a couple ideas, and there's one project that I'm getting ready to talk about that we are currently working on. So in the previous slide, I spoke briefly about VR um, and how libraries are using it for virtual tours. So what we're doing is we are creating a 3D augmented virtual tour or augmented reality tour. Um, and this actually began at the height of the pandemic. So during the pandemic, we all went virtual. Um, we had a little, we had a small reorg. Um, so I was assigned um, two direct reports. And so we formed a mini team and we started working on special projects. And one of those uh, was this augmented reality. Um, so for those of you that don't know, augmented reality is an overlay of digital content 3D models, uh, artificial intelligence assistance, IoT, wearable technology such as smartwatches, smartphones, smart glasses, smart TVs. Um, you can integrate gamification, um, an augmented chatbot, um, and robotics into the real world. They work in unison, they are a collective. This is what makes up an ecosystem of an augmented reality tour, which is what we're currently working on. Um, AI will play a more integral role with IoT also. With IoT, AI will process occupancy data, which is one example, from sensors in real time to adjust lighting and temperature and also be used to predict um, computer and technology enhanced workspace availability. So I talked about that before, where you can see it in real time. Well, you can use, you can use AI to actually predict when um, those will be available based on your own schedule. Um, if you're a patron or if you're a student, if you commonly visit on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, um, it can let you know whether or not that's, av that's available um, based, on, based on traffic, based on that data analysis. Um, also, social robots. When I attended the IDEA Institute of Artificial Intelligence um, at the University of, Knox, uh, University of Tennessee at Knoxville, um, we got a chance um, to see Pepper, uh, what you see here on the screen. So one of the professors from the Department of Computer Science came over uh, with two of his PhD candidates, um, and they talked about how they use Pepper, Pepper in, um, in some of the assisted living homes. Um, and so I immediately started thinking about, wow, we could use this um, in the library for a plethora of things. Um, one for, you know, also to be sort of a, a guided tour guide. It could actually monitor the stacks. So let's say, for example, uh, for, well, I'll put, I'll state it this way, for libraries that still do have stacks, because I know that in some cases those are starting to disappear, but there are some libraries that still have those there. Um, but imagine a student coming up, you know, using, you know, using Pepper, um, asking for a book, maybe they're, they're searching for a book that might be missing or lost, um, and then Pepper can make a recommendation um, for additional books based on that patron inquiry or um, any subject adjacent literature or uh, monograph um, based on um, the initial um, materials that they, they actually asked for. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the projects uh, that I'm working on. 
Um, the AI cosmology, um, we started this prior to um, starting at, actually starting at George Mason University. Um, before then, I was, and I still do consult with uh, public libraries and academic libraries about how to use AI. Um, and so one thing that, uh, one thing that um, myself and the people that are involved in this, pro in this uh, project, uh, we constantly heard about, you know, hear about, you know, the misrepresentation of AI, not really understanding what AI is. Um, and so what we decided to do um, was, you know, work on a public facing software visualization system of AI by tracing the genesis and the origins of the major schools of thought of AI. So it gives sort of a historical overview of AI. Also, how is AI being used in society based on um, that particular topic? So if we're talking about cognition or if we're talking about heuristics or if we're talking about inference engines, machine learning, neural networks, um, how is it actually used practically in society? Um, and so that's one way that you can keep the public informed. Um, as you probably all know, chat GPT is here, GPT-4 is here. Uh, we're actually using it um, um, in our in our in our ag augmented reality project, um, but I think that that kind of shook society to its core. You have some countries that are now banning it. You have um, a lot of um, um, I think Elon Musk just came out and he signed a petition to actually ban AI, um, and I think people are looking at a lot of the negative. Um, aspects of AI. I think obviously they're, they're there, but there's still a lot of potential for it. Um, but I think a lot of that just comes from ignorance, um, meaning that they just don't know, um, don't know really the ins and outs of what AI is. And so this is what this project um, is about. And the next is Black Squirrel GNU Linux. Um, so I write again. Before, um, I, yeah, before coming to um, Mason Libraries, I worked at another institution uh, where I began uh, developing uh, this operating system. So this operating system is, a, is for libraries, museums, and archives. I'm probably about one year away from completing it. Um, the pandemic sort of disrupted it, and, and uh, also I had a I had a house fire, so I lost a, 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 a lost a, a lot of data. So I had to. Uh, reconstitute that, um, but it's going to include security and privacy, data preservation and curation, records management, all of it AI enhanced. And then the highlight of it is computer homeostasis. Um, it's called Tammy2 and Tux Face. So I'm also working with uh, a company um, that specializes in, in AI uh, software development. Um, and so they're building the, the, the front end uh, and I'm assisting with the back end um, on, on this. And so it basically analyzes log files um, of your computer um, and it tells you whether or not, um, you know, what's wrong with the machine. Um, and there's a lot more that goes along with that. So in conclusion, I don't know if any of you know about the National AI Initiative. Um, if you haven't, I, um, I would um, ask you all to go to www.ai.gov. Um, where are the libraries? There's no discussion of the libraries anywhere. Um, and so in that AI Initiative, they talk about STEM education, they talk about research, but I don't see anywhere in the language where they discuss libraries. Why is that the case? I think that's a problem. I think that's I think that we have the opportunity um, to actually um, because we are a part of this, and I think we have an opportunity. We should have an opportunity um, to um, I won't say to protest, but I think we need to really get our hat in the game. Um, and I think this starts with the I schools. Um, not just in the curriculum, but sort of adding, adding or adopting AI. Um, and you don't necessarily have to, um, it doesn't have to be um, theoretical or have to just deal with, with uh, programming. 
Um, but you can talk about ethics, um, what AI actually is, um, how it's utilized. Public and academic libraries can start that conversation. Last week, we had a chat GPT listening party. Um, and it was myself, uh, a couple of people from some public libraries, academic libraries, software engineers, um, software analysts. And so we just asked questions to chat GPT and we sat and we analyzed and we talked about the, um, the limitations of chat, BT, chat GPT and also potential. We talked about some of the negative things, some of the positive things about it. So I think having that conversation is important. And I think library orgs, um, like ACRL, ALA, IFLA, um, which I've now seen, um, they are engaging. I'm actually going to be speaking on a panel at ALA this year about chat GPT. Um, so I see that there's some movement there, and, I, and I'm, um, I'm happy to see that. Um, but I think most importantly, one thing that libraries can do to get involved now is to create a library sandbox. And so what I mean by that is a contained virtual and on-premise environment. So that is virtual servers, that's on-premise servers or workstations, um, and also the technology that would actually, you know, be used. Um, that's separated from the university's uh, technology ecosystem. So, for example, at GMU, I have my own internet. I've brought in my own servers. Um, GMU has um, given me some of the equipment that um, I've needed, and I've had to um, uh, purchase some of the other stuff myself, and then I'm seeking a grant to get the other things. But um, <clears throat> it's great for the purpose of theoretical and practical research on existing, emerging, and future technologies. Um, and so again, whether you have staff on, whether you have staff or faculty um, that um, knows how to program or just interested, I think it's important um, that this is something that um, is done in the future. And this is something that I'm trying to kind of push, you know, it's, it's baby steps, but, you know, we're sort of getting there. Um, and so that's the end of my presentation. If you want to know more, um, please contact me, um, and thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Um, now we will have a short Q&A session for the first two presentations. Please use the Q&A button um, to post your questions. Any questions are welcome from audience, including other presenters and also committee as well. So please share your questions in the Q&A. While we are waiting for the questions, thank you, Trevor and Jeff, for your wonderful um, uh, presentations. And thank you for sharing your uh, fascinating technology you're using in your smart libraries. I'm curious about users' experience and their reaction to this kind of uh, new services using smart libraries, you know, technologies. Have you ever heard any users' feedback, their experiences? If so, please share with us. If not, do you have any plan to assess your new services? Well, uh, I'll jump in here. So um, at my library, we've, we've piloted um, uh, an uh, occupancy sensing. So mm -hmm. I mentioned that we're, um, our main library is um, under renovation. We are close to being done. So we have four of five floors are, are completed. Um, and so we are interested in, in um, you know, providing service around that space. One of those services being, you know, this idea that, that Trevor was talking about in, the, in, in that having the ability to reflect back to the community where, for example, uh, you know, which parts of the library are the busiest or which parts are the loudest or, you know, whatever it might be. So uh, we've we've done a trial with uh, um, uh, using, a using technology from a company called OcuSpace, which um, maybe some other libraries have, uh, have uh, are, I think, um, using. 
Um, and that that kind of service is really, really popular. So um, so the idea of, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, some of these um, are helpful for both the library itself. So we, you know, we are, as we, uh, you know, invest money in these spaces, we are interested in the usage of the space. And if there are spaces that we, for example, thought would be used but aren't, then uh, this is, um, this data can help, um, uh, you know, help us make smarter decisions about how to use that space. And uh, it's a service for the community, which they very much appreciate. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and, you know, to reiterate, to reiterate what Jeff uh, said, um, kind of the same thing. Um, one of the things that we did first was um, try to actually get buy-in from, um, you know, um, our colleagues uh, at George Mason University Libraries. Um, so, for example, our art librarian, she has a digital exhibit um, area, and I sat and spoke to her and said, you know, how do you think this will be useful for you? And she said, you know, I talked a little bit about um, how we could actually um, use this space in the augmented reality world. Uh, she was very excited about that. Um, and so, you know, in order to get, you know, for the library to invest in that technology, you also you have to get that buy-in, not just from administration, but by, you know, by other departments on campus. So I've had Congress, I'm, I'm getting ready to meet with Special Collections and Archives um, next week, the director there, to talk about how we can actually use it for Special Collections and Archives. Um, and um, we had a digital consultant uh, come in and I spoke to him and we've been in constant contact about, um, you know, what did what other digital projects um, the libraries uh, can use. And then in terms of students uh, and faculty um, around campus, um, most of those have been by surveys. Um, you know, students are all for that. Um, a lot of them are already using, you know, you, they already use their smartphones for just about everything. Um, not very many people use smart glasses. Um, so I think it's, it's one of those things is if it's, it's, if, it's, if it's actually available and we're not asking them to purchase it. So let's say they come in, if you want to actually don it on, I think that's some that's a topic of conversation um, or buying or purchasing the VR sets. There are some students that have to have that if you want to, if you want to do that. Everybody has smartphones. Um, so there's a lot of wearable technology that um, a lot of a lot of students have used where that will actually be beneficial to them. Um, we're certainly going to build um, some assessment on the back end. One way you can do that in the tour is um, through information literacy uh, quizzes or gamification. Um, some, you know, a lot of our libraries have been using gamification for a while now, um, but actually, you know, using it more immersively uh, is one way um, that I can think of um, that we'll use uh, for, for assessing uh, this technology. Um, but that's certainly something that we're um, looking more of and you know, we're gonna develop as we go, as we move forward. Great, thank you, Trevor. And we are receiving very interesting questions from audience here. The first question is, Trevor, for those new to AI, what books or articles do you recommend we read for a good basic introduction? Can you think of any one or two resources to introduce? Um, one really good book is Algorithms of Oppression. It's a really good book uh, by Sophia Noble. Um, and the reason why I say this is because this, this goes along with um, how um, when you think, of, and I don't know of, of, of those of you that are, are familiar with what happened, uh, but so, so Sophia Noble wrote this book, uh, Art of um, 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 Algorithm of, of Oppression. She tested Google uh, and she did some basic searches and it returned back some unfavorable sort of, you know, images for, for some of the searches she did. She did some extensive research on this. There was some backlash um, from actually from from you know colleagues and people in the field, and in some cases those people didn't even read her book, which was funny. And this was actually I was on a thread on IEEE um, where they they had uh, the historian for IEEE was one of the the culprits. Uh, IEEE tried to uh, delete that, and um, 
Um, so there was a big stir about that. But I think if you're going to start somewhere, I think that's a really good book to start with um, because you sort of get all, you, you not only you get a, um, you get a good introductory to AI, but you also get that, um, the idea of inclusivity, um, some of the things that um, that can go wrong, some of the things that go right, ethics, uh, what algorithms are, because that's what powers um, in a lot of sense what AI, what AI does. Um, and so I think that that's really good. I think also, if you are a student, um, join the ACM. Um, I'm a part of the ACM. That's the Association of Computing and Machinery. They have a SIG, I, SIG AI group, which I'm also a part of. That's a special interest group of artificial intelligence. There's a plethora of books in there, um, articles um, that will get you up to speed. There are videos. Uh, and there's con and there's conferences. Some of those are virtual. Um, they have in person. Um, same thing for IEEE, um, Triple AI. Um, there's a lot of assist. Um, I assist. There's a lot of um, um, there's a lot of, of, of resources that you can get from there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trevor. And next two questions are related to Jeff's presentation, and it's about a degree requirement and skill set. And Jeff spoke about skill set over degrees. What do you think about contributing to the curriculum development so that the library states what it now expects and needs from its employees? And the next question is related. You know, it's not about it's about not necessarily wanting the MLS. And I don't necessarily disagree. But in the current environment where intellectual freedom is so under attack in libraries, how can we be both smart in our staffing and ensure that staff understand and reflect the values of librarianship? Jeff. Yeah. Okay. So those are um, yeah, those are really good questions. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, um, I think having the opportunity to um, sort of have some of these needs reflected in the curriculum, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. And so just just to be clear, so I'm not, um, I think there's there's great value in the MLIS degree. Um, I think uh, it's probably, uh, it's probably the case that there could be um, more, um, more opportunities within some of the curriculum for, um, you know, sort of external practicums and uh, other skills development that could um, potentially uh, contribute to the to to the degree. But um, yeah, you know, one of the things that we learn in library school are, um, you know, we sort of learn the, about the core values of libraries, which are, um, you know, more important, I think, than than ever. So that's not to say that those core values aren't important, but um, I also think that those core values should be embedded in the culture of your organization. And so uh, if somebody comes into an organization without an MLIS degree, I would hope um, that through the culture that they would come to, uh, you know, sort of come to recognize that, that the, these these library values are, are um, an important part of, of the way that, that the library does business. Thank you, thank you. And here is another comment from um, another audience. Thank you for your presentation. I wonder if there would be any route to adopt the smart concept in poor libraries in non-developed countries in which there is an in incipient data-driven culture. It seems so far to reach the digital level to introduce such as AI in library services. Any thoughts? Um, well, one of the things, so part of um, what we're doing now, um, once we finish um, Mason Libraries, because we're a part of the WRLC, which Catholic University is also part of, Washington Research Library Consortium, um, the idea is to actually um, provide this information to all. Uh, so everything that we're doing, um, you know, we're, I'm not interested in commercializing this or making money off of it. I could, um, but I'm interested in sharing it so that other libraries uh, can benefit off of it as well. Um, so um, I've done a lot of traveling. I've been to, you know, well, well, IFLA is one way that they, you know, was able to get me out. And I went to Malaysia, I had a chance to visit some of the libraries out there. Uh, Greece, um, been to uh, Africa, South Africa. Um, so I think that, you know, once we have this information um, available, we'll have the information available, 
but it's going to be released uh, to the to the general public, so everyone will have access to it. Yeah, let me just add, um, you know, so a couple of things. One, I think, uh, you know, the the idea of being smart. Um, one of the things I think was 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 hoping to communicate was, you know, the idea that a lot of these practices, uh, in a way, don't have anything to do with technology, right? So. Um, a lot of these practices um, uh, are are and can be uh, uh, analog and operate um, outside of the digital realm. And then, as far as you know, that a specific technology or that specific technology, I think there's problem. There's a lot of power in collective action. And so, what one library can accomplish by themselves, perhaps a, a some sort of group or consortium, a lot consortium of libraries could can uh, can handle. So. Look to your look to your look to your colleagues. Okay, thank you, Jeff and Trevor. And here is another question to Trevor. Do you think the library sandbox can be used to make libraries lead or facilitate the management and trade of NFTs such as art pieces? Is this something that libraries can adopt as part of the smart agenda? Great question. Non-fungible. <laughs> um, that's been quite the conversation. And I think that. If you have, um, I think if it's on, if you're talking about academic libraries, if you have a um, a really if you have a robust um, arts performing arts or, or arts um, sort of department on your campus, um, and you have an art librarian um, that's actually um, that's versed in that, um, I think that's certainly um, an initiative um, that can be taken on. Um, but again, it's, it's it'll be it'll it'll require buying. I mean, is 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 NFT something that's actually being discussed? Um, you know, uh, in academia, in terms of in those classes in the classroom, um, are they encouraging students to get to, you know when they're creating um, or producing content? Um, whether you know whatever whatever that artwork is, uh, are they are they are they actually asking them? or you know encouraging them to to get nfts and so i think from that standpoint if that is the case um then certainly um the library that library or libraries in general this is something that could be um could be added as an initiative uh for sure Great. Next two questions are about its implications to uh, school library context. How would AI affect the school librarians? How should it incorporate AI in elementary school libraries with limited computers in schools and homes? That's a great question. Uh, two great questions, Michelle. Um, what I would say is if you, and I don't know if you're actually, well, I'll put it this way. If you work for a school system, um, what I would do is try to partner with um, a local institution. So for example, at Mason University uh, Libraries, one thing that we did was we partnered with the uh, public uh, library um, in Fairfax County. Um, and we're looking to partner with schools um, as well. And so you can get some, some of the students or you can get students who are interested or um, um, even their parents who may be interested in, um, you know, in, in AI technologies, um, you can have school trips, have them come to university, um, have them come to the public library if, you know, if, if uh, transportation is an issue. Um, we're going to invite people there um, and you can have workshops for kids, workshops for kids and their parents. Um, I did a Python workshop um, at the um, Sherwood Public Library, which is a part of the Fairfax Public Library, when they opened their makerspace. Um, and um, there were a lot of parents there with their kids. And I just went over the basics of Python um, and found out that there, you know, there were actually two parents there that were software engineers. And they found out a way, you know, they saw that one of his daughter was really interested. And now that's something that they're bonding over. Um, and so this is right before, like two months later, the pandemic happened. So that disrupted all that progress. So we're looking to reestablish that now. But I think that that is one way. Um, if you don't have the technology in your school, um, you know, see if the technology is available at that public library. 
Um, a lot of public libraries have maker spaces. They have this technology in there, or you can request or uh, send a request to, you know, to the library to actually, you know, um, you know, implement or integrate that. Um, so I think that those are some of the ways um, you can do that. In terms of school librarians, um, same thing, school librarians that are in the iSchool now uh, or, or in the process of, you know, you're in the iSchool and you want to become a school librarian or if you're a school librarian now, um, I think that you need to just to, to learn the technology. Um, now, you will hear a lot about how it can be used to cheat, right? Um, and obviously, you know, people are always going to look at the negative connotations, um, but there are also potential, there's also some potential there too. So I think that one of the things that you'll have to do is you'll have to um, really um, immerse yourself or at least get to know um, what AI is. That will let you know how it will actually affect you and the community or because um, there's different school libraries have different needs, um, some more than others. And so I think um, that kind of that is what will actually determine that. Yeah, let me just add really quickly. I think um, libraries generally, and I think especially school libraries have an important role to play around um, AI literacy. Right, so the technology itself aside, because this technology is gonna be so pervasive, um, especially if you're talking about uh, working with school age children um, who, for whom this technology will be a part of their everyday life. I think you know the idea of developing literacies around artificial intelligence is something that every uh, library can do and every school library, I think can, can play an important role there in just educating kids about, um, you know, in the same way that we do general information literacy, uh, developing curriculum around artificial intelligence literacy. That's a great point. Thank you, Jeff and Trevor, and thank you, audience. It's a great timing to start the second part of the session. Thank you for the great questions and the discussion. Um, our third panelist is Lars Binal. Lars has um, um, MBA in Strategy Organization and leadership from Copenhagen Business School and an associate degree in accounting from Quincy College, Massachusetts, USA. He has par participated in LIBER's um, Emerging Leaders International Development Program for the Leaders of Tomorrow's Libraries. For the last 16 years, he has been head of various departments within the TU Library, and Lars is presently in charge of student services and, manage, and the manager of the TU Media Lab that works with video production, streaming, and extended reality such as VI, AR, and MR. Um, he is especially dedicated to transforming the physical locations and virtual into a state of art learning environment that enforces and reframes innovation at the Technical University of Denmark. Within, um, within the vision for this ongoing project, the strategic aims to uh, aim, the strategic aim is to transform the library to a smart library. Lars? Um, yes. You ready? Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and thank you very much for being invited uh, today. Uh, as you said, uh, I come from uh, DTU, the Technical University of, uh, of Denmark. And I'm here to tell, talk to you about how we have implemented uh, being a smart library and why. Um, as you said, uh, my background is uh, within business and accounting. And I just love uh, data and tech and uh, all that. So that's why <laughs> that's probably why I love doing it too. Um, a little bit about our university. Um, I come from Denmark, and our university is in Denmark, and it's a country in Europe. Um, we have about uh, 13,000 13, students. And we are about 6,000 employees at the university. Um, the strategic aim of our university uh, has uh, three objectives, uh, being the best within education in Europe uh, and uh, being more sustainable 
and working on more sustainability uh, around the world. And of course, uh, digitization uh, as a tool and uh, yeah, a way of thinking. So we as a library, of course, wants to uh, uh, work with that too. This is uh, our campus and our library down there, small one. And uh, we have a second library too. My responsibility is all the physical spaces and all the services within. So the smart library is very much about that. As you said, I'm also in charge of uh, our media lab that uh, live streams and, and record um, lectures at our university and does all the video productions at the university. And as you said, we're also experimenting a lot with uh, using um, XR, extended reality within uh, education. So the agenda for the next couple of minutes is why we started up Smart Library, the implementation process, a few cases and some final notes. 50 years ago, our library was built uh, and it was built in concrete and it was primarily to store books. Um, that has changed a lot over the years. So now the, the library is not really for books, but for people. Um, so we took most of the books about 20 years ago and uh, put in the basement. The rest of the books we actually burned uh, because they were doubles of what everybody else had. So you could get it another place in Denmark. But uh, the, the learning paradigm changed and uh, we went from uh, the lecture hall and one-way uh, communication to a more group-oriented uh, studies. And of course we needed uh, a space for that uh, at the university and a good place to do that was uh, at the library. But as I said, we, um, it was a concrete building <laughs> built for books. So a lot of challenges uh, appeared. Um, first of all, we opened up 24 seven and uh, we found out that uh, this building was not uh, safe. To, it was not safe to be in because uh, so many students showed up and started using the, the premises. Um, all these people that came in, you know, there's about two and a half thousand uh, visitors a day in the library. Um, they create a lot of heat. And our ventilation systems were not uh, uh, ready for that. Um, also, a lot of people create a lot of smell, uh, noise, and uh, and the lights. That was only built to so you could be able to pick a book from the shelf, and not really for reading. It was about two hundred fifty lux. And a good light is about 450 lux for reading. So there were many things we, that we discovered uh, we had to do. The CO2 level was also very high. And, you know, the students complained about uh, being tired and headaches uh, in the library. And of course, the power sockets are also an, always an issue in a library. So we thought, okay. And uh, it was very expensive building to run. Um, we weren't very sustain sustainable. Uh, so we had to work on that. And uh, we, had to, we had to start talking with the, the campus service and the building of the facility management about this, but we had no, no measurements of uh, what goes on in the library. So we, we couldn't talk about it. There was, there was no census almost in the library. So we came up with uh, a vision um, of building this smart library. But 
uh, it, we came, it became apparent to us that uh, comfort was uh, a very central word or a concept for uh, uh, creating a smart library. Um, comfort is, is important in a learning situation. And the main focus for us as, as a physical uh, place was that our students should be able to learn while they were studying at the library. So feeling at home was very important to us, but also uh, the indoor climate uh, was, we found that it was, that you could improve your learning situation or the, the, or the possibility of learning something by almost uh, one third, if you could meet people's comfort zone or comfort level or comfort profile or whatever you could uh, call it um, because we have all we all are different uh, when it comes to that and i'll get back to that so but our library has many functions we also have uh, big conferences uh, summits we have the university's yearly party uh, in the library so when we had to rebuild uh, or refurnish or, you know, create the smart library, uh, we had to think of that. We couldn't just build walls all over the place and small, small boxes where people could study. It's still, as you can see, it's it's big uh, office building kind of place. So, so this is uh, the vision that we came up with, and uh, I'm just going to give you uh, 30 seconds to, to read it. So the most important thing here is that we're taking the library to another level, uh, creating a, an indoor living lab. And uh, I don't know if it is, but I think maybe it might be the, the biggest indoor living lab uh, in the world. It's 5,000 square meters. And we can study everything that goes on in the library. We can follow everything. Uh, we have data on everything. So, it's, it's a way of studying what goes on in, in a real life place. Um, and it's, it creates data that uh, students and researchers can, can work on. And we're boosting the chances of learning. So in the summer of 2017, we started renovating uh, the library. And uh, this is how it turned out. And you can see the cape channels and the lighting in the ceilings. I'll get back to that up too. So new acoustic ceilings uh, all over the place, also on the all the concrete walls. Um, a new ventilation system that can uh, change the um, the air four times an hour instead of four times a day. Uh, 500 extra sockets, and of course, uh, everything that is needed for the safety of uh, all the people uh, in the library. And we also installed uh, dynamic light, uh, like we heard in the, in the previous two um, presentations. And this is possible. It was uh, LED lights, and uh, it has saved us a lot of money to put in LED. And uh, it uh, adjusts um, uh, uh, when, you know, when it meshes uh, the light outside. So it's, uh, it's reddish in the morning and it becomes bluish in the afternoon and it becomes reddish again at night. Uh, because it follows uh, the rhythm of the light outside or um, the, on the Kelvin scale. So uh, 
and it's supposedly very good for uh, our mental health that when we're inside that the light follows the light outside because it's very important for our, our uh, schedule uh, in our head so uh, besides that uh, we have the two and a half kilometers of uh, cable champions where it's possible for students and researchers put to put up their own uh, sensors very easy with uh, power sockets and everything and we have divided everything into 27 zones uh, that I'll get back to, uh, too. And of course, and then we're trying out with the uh, manual zones where you can adjust it yourself. Uh, there's much to learn about light uh, that, uh, yeah, well, I won't get into that now. Um, we have put up uh, a ton of sensors all over the library. Um, and uh, this is some things that we measure. Um, so we can practically measure everything. We also measure pollen. So if you are allergic to pollen, um, we can show you where to, where's the best seat in the library if you want to have, uh, well, if you want to study. <laughs> so um this is uh one of the maps we have of where the the sensors are placed uh on one of the floors on the ground floor and this is our strategic focus uh when in the library as i said the main focus is our learning environment we want we want to make it as easy as possible for students to learn something when they study in the library and that means meeting their comfort zone. And uh, we also want to develop their uh, data skills. And we want to be able to talk to facility management and save money, and not just with them, but also within our own uh, staff. So first, uh, the learning environment. Our aim, our ultimate aim is that when students come into the library, they should be able to find a seat that fits their comfort level. I believe in the future, we'll all have a comfort profile built on machine learning or AI from whatever rooms we are in over time, maybe from our home too. Um, that follows us so so that the room that we walk into knows what comfort profile we have. But to start out with, we'll have uh, screens and stuff so students can find uh, where, uh, what meets their comfort level, or they should be able to adjust uh, the, the level around their seat uh, so it meets their comfort level. And this also means the economics of uh, of their seats and, and how they're sitting. That's that's very important too. So we've created this dashboard that students can uh, can use to to see where in the library um, it meets their comfort, and and if if the CO two level is bad in one level, in one area of the library. Another service is uh, on our website uh, and at the entrance of the, of the library. You can see how many people are in the library and how many free seats that are still there. And you can also see a for forecast of how it, how it will be on the different days. Um, and this actually came in very handy during the corona. Um, and uh, we could adjust and have a stop sign outside of the library whenever uh, we could go from 50 uh, visitors or 100 visitors or how many we could have in the library at the certain, the certain times. So we could do that from one day to the other when we had all this data. Um, and then we're working with uh, different dashboards and seeing uh, what works for our students and, and what will they 
uh, use. Uh, here they can see the desk occupancy um, uh, at a certain area of the library that we're testing out. And they can also choose uh, uh, what zone they want to be in and see uh, some of the measurements there. We've also built uh, an app. Um, and this is our, our uh, way of uh, creating the first app that runs on live data. Uh, but uh, our data is, uh, is available for the students to create their own apps. So they can, on top of all the data, they can create all the, their own app within Microsoft uh, Power App that fits their needs. So, and uh, I'll get back to that under uh, uh, data uh, skills. Uh, this is an example of how we can work with uh, some of the data from uh, the desktop uh, desk uh, occupancy. Uh, we've added some uh, variables to uh, to the data on where's the, where are the tables? Are they near window? Are they elevatable uh, tables? Are they in groups? Are they pointed inwards or outwards? Um, and uh, this is our, just our first try of uh, trying to analyze some of that data. And it seems like uh, an elevated table near the window is, is uh, the best choice uh, for our students. And we can uh, upscale this to uh, the rest of the library and the, the 800 seats we have uh, in the library. And we can start analyzing what is being used uh, in different times. And... Um, and uh, what do they like? So this is uh, this is like a continuous uh, U UX of what goes on in the library. So all this data we're collecting and giving out again to students and and researchers that want to use it. And um, also we are connecting our own infrastructure in the library to the rest of the universities. Um, we have a smart campus initiative with about 300,000 uh, sensors. That way we're starting to track everything that goes on. So, and we will be uh, a library where people can come and get uh, data instead of books. <laughs> um, because, as I think it was uh, Trevor that said it, uh, not all libraries uh, are focused that much on books anymore, uh, especially not us that are technical university. 99% of uh, everything that we have, or 99.9, .9, is digital. So, um, yeah, and we're using uh, all the, the possible uh, uh, technical infrastructure so that uh, our students can come with their own sensors and they can hook up to our infrastructure right away. So this is a, a little overview of, uh, of the technical infrastructure, just uh, the sensors are hooked up uh, and we're using uh, Microsoft Azure um, and just an SQL database. And on top of that, we have light live data that we can use uh, through Power BI for, for dashboards or, or Power Apps. Uh, once Lars, a week. Um, I'm a, a bit um, mindful about the time. <laughs> yes. Okay. I will go quick then. Um, we have workshops where people can work on the data and uh, work on XR. And uh, we have students doing master thesis where, and we put those into our library system so they're accessible there. And the data we put into our data repository uh, for research data. So, and working with the facility management, of course we can use that to, to use the seats better. Um,
Um, yeah, only light on the people, only ventilate when needed, only heat and cool when needed. That is some things that we can do now with all the data. We have hooked up the, the elevators too, and we're tracking uh, when they're being used and when they're not being used. And we can use that to nudge people to use the stairs instead of uh, that. So we can use that to, to only have uh, library staff when, uh, when it's needed, only have IT service when needed and only cleaning when needed. And this is an example of data used to, to see how much the, the toilets are being used on the different floors. And as you can see, the blue toilets are being used a lot more. So we, uh, we have adjusted the cleaning. So it's only cleaned when needed and not just regularly uh, or on a regular schedule. We are working student projects in AR and putting the data into augmented reality so we can find the sensors and working with uh, researchers on the light situation in the library and uh, the ability to concentrate and learn better. So some final notes, lack of talent within IoT. Uh, we've solved that by, um, by hiring students at the, at the technical university. They're really good. Uh, so they're helping us out uh, doing all this. Um, and of course, in Europe, we have GDPR um, and uh, in the data ethics that is very important, keeping uh, everybody anonymous. So just to tell you, this is, uh, there's a lot of strategic potential by putting yourself in the center of what goes on at the university. Um, everything that we do in the library can be upscaled to the rest of the university so that the university can save money and uh, create better learning spaces all over the university. So I hope that uh, this has been uh, an inspiration for all of you. So. Uh, Thank you for now. Thank you, Lars. Um, our next panelist is Turga Buyanemek. Um, Turga is a PhD candidate in public administration and policy. He also serves as a graduate assistant for the Center uh, for Technology and Government at the, at the University at Albany. His research interests include but not, are not limited to smart cities, digital transformation, and social innovation. Please welcome Torba. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm, I'm honored to be here and joined by such an by such uh, impressive panel. And I think my presentation will speak to all what has been said before, especially to um, this idea of library as a partner that Jeff mentioned, and also this uh, notion of technology and how library is the right place to test and be exposed to technology, including to smart city technology. And this is part of larger research I've been doing with uh, Dr. Mila Gasco Hernandez, whose uh, shoes I'm feeling in today also. Um, and we've been exploring the role of libraries in developing smart cities. Um, 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 this is, uh, as I said, we did, we've, we've done two projects. One of them is based uh, mostly in US. We've been exploring the role of public li libraries in developing smart cities. And this was uh, research funded by IMLS. And the second research, which is more international examination of this role, this is the one that I intimately worked on and uh, I'm very uh, more exposed. And this is where um, I will speak more a little bit more about today. But of course, the findings are also relevant to libraries around the world. And uh, I know we already know by now what the smart libraries are, but uh, this is uh, uh, some, some of the definitions in the literature. Of course, I believe this one captures it well, that says that services and programs, libraries are interactive, innovative, informative, real, changing, and international. And since uh, our focus is how libraries develop, develop smart cities and smart city has been a very controversial term with many definitions and still ongoing work in terms of definition, 
I believe the following definition uh, of smart city, where smart city is a city that holds a holistic view and integrates a dual perspective of technology and human development to pursue a triple goal. One of them is to enhance the efficiency of urban operations. Second one is to increase the quality of life and then advance economic development while still having this sustainability as, as this common background is the definition that captures what smart city is. And within that, of course, the focus is on smart citizens. Um, citizens. Smart citizens, we believe, are people who are able to actively participate in building and deciding what type of city they want to live in. So this is the idea that smart city is a city built for citizens by and with, with citizens. So this is what the smart citizens idea comes in. And smart community is just more of a geographical or congregation of these smart citizens, if you will, who use technology to transform their region in significant and fundamental ways. And we find for our research that public libraries contribute to smart city development in three ways. First is by developing smart citizens, giving them the skills and access to use technology with purpose. And this includes, of course, advanced technology as well. Uh, second is uh, they also allow uh, the citizens to interact, learn, and engage in smart city initiatives. And also, of course, this includes civil society organizations and other stakeholders. Third, we find that public libraries really provide this innovative environment where pairs group can experiment, interact, innovate together to improve individual and collective outcomes. In all these three different roles, we find in that context matters. And uh, of course, how, how libraries contribute to uh, smart city development depends on their environment. And um, this is what something also Jeff mentioned, that really we see in public libraries as strategic partners in the development of smart cities, although underappreciated, but we still believe that they have really, this is an underutilized partnership that has a lot to give to smart city development. And at the same time, we've seen that this is not really one directional relationship. It's actually also libraries are becoming smarter in the process of contributing to smart city development. And uh, this is more going into the findings. Uh, as I said, the first uh, role we see that libraries develop smart citizens and how smart this understood, of course, varies by the context. In some environments, uh, in some libraries we studied, this means providing people with access to technology and digital skills so they can really impact all the decisions that, they, that data technology is used to uh, define services and the environment. So from that point of view, one of the interviews said that you cannot really have smart city without smart citizens. And, but how do you have these smart citizens? You give the people ability to really chime in on all the data decisions and data collection decisions that are happening and affect their life. And um, uh, of course, uh, I think Lars talked about this before. Some libraries are really involved in being the bridge, allowing different groups to learn more about emerging technology and really serving as a platform for dig digital education. Again, this is the, the purpose of making those stakeholders or uh, improving their ability to be involved in defining what city they want to live in. Uh, we also find that in, in some cities, the building digital, digital skills is really part of this mandated uh, charge to improve literacy and expand people's opportunity to advance. So here it's, it's more of the understanding that developing smart citizens is all about formal and non-formal education. And here, of course, basic programming and coding is one of, one of the first steps to doing so. And the second bucket or second way of uh, public libraries we see uh, are contributing to smart development is enabling citizen participation. And again, how this takes place depends on the locale and the context. We've seen, we've seen that in, in some libraries, this is all about uh, the library itself is seen as a hub for participation and they house all these different associations and no matter if it's cultural or sports, basically they become the central hub where engagement within community and with community is created. Um, and of course, this includes uh, uh, smart city technologies, initiatives, and also discussing political issues, community issues. And um, at the same time, in, in some cities, um, the citizen engagement with smart city is understood as mainstreaming technology and digital, digital skills. So this again goes back a little bit to um, building skills and allowing empowering people with knowledge to really have the capacity to engage in smart city activities. 
And as far as innovation, um, we, we, we've seen that, of course, uh, uh, as Lars also mentioned, and all the uh, panelists talked about this, how this, uh, all this technology and innovation data available within libraries contributes uh, to, uh, to be in a place for innovation. And really, we've seen that public libraries are community level innovation, innovation infrastructures that enable citizen, citizen, citizen science, where citizens uh, on the same playing field with scientists and others can contribute and offer solutions to issues in their communities. And also we've seen how this library fulfills this important role of being connection agent where resources, people, knowledge, and networks connect to co-create the solutions to meet the challenges of today through innovation and use of technology. In, in, in other cities, we see how this innovation is really entrepreneurship focused. It also has to do, of course, with certain social issues such as youth unemployment. And there's this big focus of uh, enabling people to really advance individually and collectively. So this is about building skills and um, also uh, nurturing their entrepreneurship to create projects that can actually turn into business ideas. And um, overall, as, as, as you know by now, libraries are smart and they are getting even smarter. So um, to, to wrap up all those contributions, again, we're seeing that the libraries are contributing by building these skills and capacities required for people to participate in smart city initiatives. And uh, they expand these opportunities to participate by increasing action potential of different stakeholders to participate in local affairs. In some libraries, well, it, it could be smart city initiatives. In other libraries, citizen participation is deemed as programs and services related to inclusive deployment of technology and capacity building. As far as innovation, again, these are community level infrastructure, innovation infrastructures where citizens can, with others, um, research, engage in smart city initiatives. And also, uh, they, these are hubs for entrepreneurship. Where, citizen, where citizens can use technology to innovate, prototype, and generate business ideas. Um, we also finding that more libraries collaborate, the smarter they become. And uh, uh, the research, this, this was a quantitative research we've done also, it shows that really the collaboration and partnerships with different stakeholders allow libraries to become more smarter and also for those stakeholders to become smarter in the process, contributing to the smart city development. And uh, as, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, context really matters on how this takes place. And we're finding that in a well-researched environment, public, public library programs and services really focus on helping this uh, generally affluent and educated citizens to learn about data and, and decisions that are made with technology and data in, that impacts their, their well-being. In less resource environment, we've seen how public library programs and services really trying to address this uh, pressing issue, social issues of the past uh, and present. And really trying to expand these people, empower people and expand their opportunity to advance and become self-sufficient. Ultimately, how these roles are played can, be, can, can also differ by locale and they can be intertwined. So meaning that by fulfilling one role, they actually can also be helping to um, uh, advance another role. And um, of course, uh, this this roles can be also um, also uh, played at different times, but in the end, they all contribute to smart city development. And with that, I just wanted to also share some more resources we we developed as part of the research we've done. And this there are reports publicly available. And one of the second item here I would like to draw attention to is this: we developed this toolbox uh, that uh, allows, especially for uh, library professionals and uh, public library directors to um, trace and also to look at how they can develop or also to um, really sh really advance their contributions, also make visible those contributions to smart city development and perhaps develop partnership for the future smart city development. And um, with that, uh, I, will, I will be uh, wrapping up my presentation.